One. Here we go on three. One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-host S with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How are you feeling? Uh, something that I have not, I don't think, ever said off the top. I'm annoyed. Wowzer. Something that I have not told you about because I didn't know it was going to become a problem. It's become a problem. We've been getting ding-dong ditched. And I am livid about this. That's a little something I've also been known to refer to as Nikki Nikki Nine Doors. Yes. Yes. Here's the thing. When I was a kid, there were two kinds of people in the world. One, the badass who was willing to go ring someone's doorbell and run. Mm-hmm. Or the old fucking loser who's in the house who's getting their doorbell rung. And that's it. I never did it myself as a kid. So that proves there are three types of people in the world. uh, Because I was always too frightened. Uh, Just couldn't handle the anxiety of it. But to be on the other side, I hate it. And it upsets my anxious cat. The other cat doesn't care. But the anxious one startles when the doorbell rings and they do like a doorbell and a knock and they fucking take off they did it once to us yesterday they did it once months ago so it could have been somebody else but they did once yesterday and then around the same time today they did it again and i was livid but i'm like fine it is what it is and then like an hour later we have one of our windows open These kids are basically standing under our window, not realizing it's open, planning out the attack to come get us again. Why your house? Why are you being targeted? Thank thank you so much. Because I said to my husband, I said, you know what? I said, I know this sounds dramatic, but this feels like a targeted attack. And he's like, I, I don't know. And... He heard these kids, he heard, he said he heard them say something about like, maybe this time uh, he'll get his dad to come out or something. So I'm like, does that mean they know my kids? Well, he got a picture of them, showed my kids and my kids are like, we don't know who these kids are. Um, And when they got to the door, my husband like tore it almost off the hinges and like called them assholes, told them to fuck off, told them to never come back. Like he tore into them in a way I have never heard him scream before. So I've said, you've done one of two things. You've either made it so they'll never come back or you've egged them on. So we'll see. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. That's uh, it's a 50 50. That's oh, 50/50. yeah. Yeah. It could go either way. A hundred percent. So I'm braced for it. But I've, I immediately felt 90 years old. Yeah. When I'm like, oh, doorbell, I open the door and I'm like, not a package. Wait, did they do that on purpose? And then I was like, am I that age? What? Us. So yeah, I've never seen those kids in the neighborhood. So I don't think they live around here, but I'm, we're talking like, do we now get a, some sort of a a doorbell camera? My suggestion is, do we get a die pack? Like, (laughs) When you're stealing money. So that if they anybody who rings our doorbell, uh-oh, what's that paint on your hands? Then I just go hunting them all down. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have to just, <laughs> let's just step this back for a second. Let's walk it back. Yeah. How, how many times have they rang the doorbell now? Uh, in the last two days, three times. Three. Okay. All right. I thought you were going to say twice. Three times, is it feels they like it's it, escalating. They did it once yesterday and they did it the once today, but then they did it a second time like an hour later. So it's, it was the double attack today that pushed me over the edge. Of course. Every once in a while, fine. I get it. I can take a good ribbing. But <laughs> twice in a small span, get a fucking Xbox. Like, well, I mean, this is tough because they are outside. Totally. outside. They are outside. The unfortunate thing is, is that they're choosing to use their outside, outdoor time for, for ne'er-do-well behavior. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You know, 
I will say it's only knock wood. It's only happened to me one time in my house. And I here's what this speaks to who I am. I have a video doorbell. And so right. I looked and it was a kid. It was, a I don't know, 12. I don't know kid ages. Anyway, it was a kid. Uh, rings it and runs. To this day, I could tell you exactly what his face looks like. And I'm convinced that it's a bigger part of some sort of bigger conspiracy scam. Like I, it oh, haunts me. Sure. It haunts me. So I, I get it is my point. I get it. Now, I don't think that you're that these, these, um, I'll say it. You can uh, call them hooligans. It's okay. <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that your hooligans, Thank uh, you. are part of a bigger conspiracy. It feels like they've tipped their hand that they're just wanting they're wanting to see if they can get both oh, yeah. parents to come out. What I don't like, again, is that it's speaking as though they know who lives in the house. Correct. And if you don't know them, then it's like, are they watching you? See, but I'm not the right person to talk to about this. Because, again, like, I've... No, you're absolutely the right person to talk to about this because you're saying everything that I've already said. So you're making me seem less crazy by being like, see, everybody else thinks this way. Well, not everybody else, but certainly me. <laughs> Oh, it's just, it's, again, it's the annoyance of, I'm in the middle of working. I'm trying to get notes done for this episode. I'm trying to horse blinders, so I'm just focused on my work. So then I got to put the laptop down, come up, go to the door, and there's nobody there. And it also sends one of my cats, like, jumping through the roof when the doorbell goes off. And she was sleeping, like, right in front of the door. Here's what I'll say. Yeah. Come Halloween time every year, I give out the full bars. Of course. And, and I'm going to tell you why. It's currency. Okay? Sure. It's currency with the neighborhood kids. Sure. Now, either, much like your, I'm either, they won't mess with me because I do give, I give them a full chocolate bar at Halloween, or I'm being targeted for being a pushover. Oh. I'm being targeted with what else can we get from her? So it's 50-50. Look, I thought you were going to suggest that come Halloween, I hold that picture up to every kid, make them remove their mask. And if they are the same child, they get fucking nothing but a boot out. Um, I don't know. We, we don't do full size bars. But since the pandemic, we literally just put a box on our step full of so much variety of shit and tell them take two. I know a lot of them take more than that. But that's like a free for all. It's like a tickle trunk. Get in there. They you know the thing, the thing in my neighborhood also is is that the past few years I've barely had any kids. Like even pre-pandemic. Oh, my yeah. first year here I had a ton. I ran out of candy. And then after that it's just been it's dwindled even with the non huh. the non um quarantine years, the non uh, pandemic right. years. So yeah, I don't know. I was thinking about doing that too. The big thing for me is I can't have the doorbell rings because of the dogs. It tortures them. Oh, it absolutely sure. tortures them. So I typically sit out there Halloween night. Of I'm that course. lady. You of know course. what I mean? Yeah. 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 We just put the box bef like far enough before the doorbell that they never touch our doorbell. Well, it's nice that they do. They respect that. Oh, yeah. They literally just come up, take whatever they want and leave. And it's usually pretty nice because the doorbell drives me crazy. But now and I absolutely would have done that this year. But now I'm thinking I might do the plan of remove your mask. <laughs> you know what you should do have you is you should print boy? out. Well, yeah, you yeah. should print out like little mug shots and make posters and be like, I see you fuckers. That's what it should say. on the <laughs> <laughs> Uh, their parents are absolutely going to contact me. Yeah. Um, but to that, I say, good. Yep. You should know what your kids are doing. Yeah. And the answer is some fairly harmless fun that has put us both into a spiral. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Look, it was harmless years ago. Again, I was the child who could never bring myself to do it. It stressed me out too hard. I was like, oh, oh. I could never. Say, I think I may have been put like pushed into doing it, but I never, oh, sure. never of my own free will. Sure. See, this is just some kids that just like that. It's like, it's like, you know, it's like they say this. <laughs> it's like to quote the dark night. Some men just like to watch the world burn. Like, it's like, sure. I think, I guess that that's what it is. Mate, what's going on at home? Maybe something's going on at home sure. and they're desperate for attention. 
oh, I think there's also a possibility they just like the thrill. And it's like, oh, you like that now? Next thing I know, you're going to be suddenly driving way too fast. And then next thing you know, uh uh-oh, what's that? It's a meth addiction. (laughs) I I was going to say you got to be careful that you don't get a flaming bag of poop on the front step. But yeah, this could translate. This could transfer into meth for sure. My husband did make a comment about like it, like at least it's not that level. So this isn't really that bad. And yes, it's harmless and all of those kinds of things, but it has just annoyed me. They pushed me on the wrong day. Yeah. I'm if just they also... pushed me days ago, then I would have been like, ah, oh, yeah. They I pushed don't... me on the wrong day. The only other concern I have is twofold an egging. Oh, yeah. Well, and a toilet papering. Yeah, I think the egging would be worse. The egging is worse. But um, that's when you print out the pictures of their faces and then you you drop off a wanted poster at every school and every post office and be like, the police have been alerted. They have your faces. Well, you'll love this. Assuming they live in the area because there were no bikes. I know what school they attend. Look, they didn't realize that they were Nikki Nikki Nindoring, a host of a true crime pod, true crime podcast who it's has true. nothing but resources. You know what I'm saying? Do true. we use our resources for good? Only ever for good. Yeah, only ever for good. Oh, I, I don't know. I fully considered putting a photo like on a face local Facebook group to be like, "Do you know these boys?" You know, kind of a situation. But then I worried that their parent would be like, what's the problem? Leave them alone. Like, yeah, that's absolutely what would happen. I know. I want the parent who's like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I don't. Well, like, that's also possible, but I don't know that it's worth the risk. It's not. But now I'm terrified of Halloween. Yeah. I'm now not going to stop thinking about it. It'll be interesting if they come back tomorrow. Or if they come back, like if they continue to do this. What day is this happening? Are they skipping school? (laughs) Oh, no. That's the thing. Like, it was probably like four, uh, like maybe almost five o'clock. What time does school get out? 3.15? Well, it depends on the school here, but either 3 or 3.30, depending. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm building a profile. So these are kids- who mm. an hour and a half plus are yeah. still wandering the streets. They're not going home for dinner. Latchkey. We're building a profile. We're building a profile. It's a, yeah. it's more than possible. It's more than possible. And then that feels again, like I was saying, this feels like it's a cry for attention. Oh, it could be. It could be. Well, but, uh, yeah, look, Again, harmless fun, but God, it annoyed me. Keep us posted. We're invested now. All of us. I I speak for all the listeners. I think they'll let me. Oh, yeah. If you think I'm also not going to have that window open and be prepared to eavesdrop around the same, like I'm suddenly going to shut down everything I'm doing tomorrow around that time and just what would be perfect is yes, you have to keep an eye out. And if you can, if you can time it, that just as they're coming to the door, you open the door and catch them in the act, that, that I think would send them, I don't think they'd come back. Can I do so legally with water guns? I wouldn't. Damn it. I wouldn't. Yeah, because I would. Water balloons? Water balloons? Yeah. But But water. then I'm worried that that'll make them step it up and then then comes the egging. You know what? You're starting a war then. Yeah. You're starting a war and you don't want that. Don't, don't. Don't let your mouth write a check. Your body can't cash. It is true. It's true. It just feels so specifically targeted. I'm like, are they doing this to other places? Like others on our street? Or is it just us? Well, I'd say ask your neighbors, but <laughs> I don't think you or I talk to our neighbors. <laughs> That's not true. I talk to my neighbors. I talk to my neighbors. I don't. Just two um, two houses, I, three houses. I don't. Yeah. No. I hear you. Look, 
we got so much to talk about. Uh, I also just want to address for anybody, anybody watching, I'm coming directly from a photo shoot. So if I look a little whatever happened to baby Jane, just know that I was <laughs> at a very stylized photo shoot yeah. and did not have time to reset my makeup by the time I got home. So it is what it is. Um, great. Thank you kindly. Thank you kindly. I Sometimes... literally rolled out of a shower into this. Yeah. So well, I'm a sopping mess, but it is what it is. Look, I respect that. I respect that. Now, listen, I want to bring up something very quickly before we get into the rest of this, which is yeah. there's homework for the listeners. Right. So get out your pens yeah. and papers. Get out your devices. We want you to make a note. Yep. Our next episode is going to be based on a new documentary called Last Stop Larima. Why is this exciting? Well, to be clear, we haven't been paid by them, but they did give us an advanced copy. Yeah. So we've already seen this. This documentary is going to go out onto Max on October 8th. So if you have access, and I know that the Max is not worldwide, but if you have access, you got to watch it because our episode that comes out October 10th, is that right? Yes, uh, October 10th. I think so. Is going to be a big discussion about this episode, about this this documentary. So we want to give people lots of notice. Yeah. Set your alarms, set your devices, make your notes. If you can, watch that documentary before the episode because then it's going to be like you're taking part in the discussion with us in real time. Boy, oh boy, oh, how exciting. Yeah. Also, for the record, we loved this documentary. Oh, yeah, we were chatting about it in real time. Chatting about it in real time. It's yeah. also a story that took place in uh, Australia. Yeah. So, listen, very exciting. True crime case. What a story. Last Stop yeah. Larima, look for it October 8th on Max, and then our episode is going to be next week on the 10th. So get ready to live, folks. <laughs> I just want to give people, I want to give people notice. You know what I'm saying? Of course. That's I why mean, I was like, I'll... I got to talk about it off the top of the episode before yeah. we get all into the case and whatnot. Just making the note now. Of course. I got a couple other quick things before we get into it. Well, first of all, what you drinking over there? Oh, just a water and a Slurpee today. Again, it's. I've had a day. It's yeah. fine, but it's it's just it's there's just been some stresses. So what have I sure. done? Well, I don't have a lot of booze. Well, that's not true. I have a lot of like I don't have a lot of uh, I don't have any wine in the house or anything like that. So I was like, what do I want? What do I have? Well, the only mix I have is Gatorade. I've absolutely made myself a vodka Gatorade. And let me tell you something. This is an orange Gatorade. With the vodka, for some reason, it tastes a bit like a creamsicle. I'm not mad at it. And Ooh, to that, I say, okay. is this the smartest thing I've ever done? Like drinking the Gatorade with the alcohol? I mean, that feels like I'm staving off a hangover to begin with. Yeah. Can you imagine it with like a whipped cream vodka? That would be perfect. In fact, I'm writing that down. <laughs> that would be delicious. Right? I just feel like that would add just the scotch extra of the sweetness to. Yes. Oh, hell yes. I like that. Uh, now, there is one other piece of business we got to get to before we get into the case. And that is a follow up to last week's episode. <laughs> we got into a lot of discussions about aliens. We did. <laughs> and we one, did. Of the, one of the things that came up was, of course, our different depictions of what we think aliens would look like. Yes. I then tasked us with. Uh, each of us drawing uh, what our version of what we think an alien would look like now. And then we're going to put it on merch. This is not, this is nothing that has to be rushed because we're taking the weight of this quite seriously. Yes. So the, the update is we're not ready yet now, but Christy, I know, I know that you said you might be willing to reveal to me something about like what artistic medium you'll be working in. Are you prepared? To, do you want to know in advance? Because I have. Yes, because I want to make sure more than I can chew. I want to raise to your level is the other problem. Because because look, dear listeners, I'll be honest. I did the task. Christy didn't. She was too busy. It's not. This isn't a competition and I'm not. But my point is, is that I'm like, if I sit on this and then in, in a week and a half or whenever it is that we do this, I feel like mine's jank. I'm going to be beside myself so yes i think i'd like to know what you're doing so then yeah. i know whether i want to adjust of course look i uh, once once i 
opened my full mouth and said we should put this on merch, I immediately kicked us up a level that I wasn't prepared for. Yep. And football season really takes a lot of my free time. Well, I don't have a lot of free time. Uh, I don't I just think have you need to, to justify it. Though. I know. Uh, so I hadn't got to it. Um, my plan is this weekend, but I've ordered a variety of clays. <laughs> God damn. I'm, I'm going to try and make a, make a small 3D model. The thing is, I'm taking it too far. I've never worked with this sort of thing before. So it's going to be the most, like, it's it's just learn as you go, I guess. I don't well, know. Well, there's I'm part pumped. of me that feels like I need to show what I've done so far. Because spoiler alert, yeah, I'm going to have to kick it up a notch. If you're doing a full clay rendering, modeling, it's not going to be like life size. It's just going to be small because... I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm going to regret it and end up drawing something at the end. Well, that's fair too. I guess the other thing is, is that we have to make sure that it's easily photographable to put on the merch. You know what I oh, mean? Oh, if you think I haven't already considered, like, I'm going to have to figure out a way to take pictures of this. Yeah. I feel like mine's jank now. Mine feels You're too simple. Jank. Are you kidding? Again, I'm pointing out, I've never worked with clay, I'm hoping it's similar to a Play-Doh. I don't think it's gonna be. It's gonna. This is this is gonna. Clay be a mess. is quite quite thick. Oh yeah, I'm concerned. All right, I don't well, I'm gonna show I've mine done. because I think I'm gonna need to redo it. I'll be honest, I'm just excited. Don't... Yes, of course. <laughs> I mean, look, there's so... a part of me that wants wanted to do it 3D because the idea of as soon as he's done, he's gonna go back on my shelf. Oh, of course. And I'll forever have that little. Doodad. Well, and the pajama pants that I end up making. Um, so listen, so there's another reason why I feel like I want to talk about this very briefly right now. And that is yeah. as I was creating this, I started to laugh to myself because I started to put to, I started to do a little bit of psychology work on myself and realize a couple of things. But I'm just going to show you. This is him. This is it. <laughs> He's adorable. So, uh. I guess for me, what it is, is that I really like his vibe. Of you know, he's, course. He's leaning on his knuckles. You know what I'm saying? Relaxed. He's, he's yeah. relaxed. I like his little legs. I like his hips. Yes. But my favorite part of this piece, mm -hmm. which I did in sparkle crayons. Of so course. this is, he's sparkly, much like a Twilight vampire. Um, it's the extended foot. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that oh. this is the cutest thing I've ever done. I, I, yeah. I'm I obsessed with that little extended foot. But again, I here's what I've learned. It isn't, it isn't neon enough. I want it more neon. I was like, I think I need to get into paints. I think I need to paint him. I need to paint him like a French girl. But, but as I was coloring this, yeah, I was like, I want it as green as possible. I want him as, as little. In, and then I started to realize this is checking the box of my love of lizards and frogs. Oh, which is something we talked sure. about on Patreon last week. Yeah. I, I, I want it to be lime green. I want it to have the little legs. I'm like, I'm basically, I'm basically making an adorable frog lizard man. I think that that's my alien. Yeah. That makes sense. And my hope, I guess if I'm being honest, it's not necessarily that I think that they would look like this. I just really want them to look like that. Of course. Of course. Anyway. The gauntlet's Look, been thrown down. I, oh, I already hate myself for having said it out loud. Because if I had, I could have just choked down the cost of that clay I'd never use and just tried to draw something. But now, I mean, again, what's this going to be? I have no idea. I'm realizing that maybe mine should also be clay. Oh my God. Maybe this off. is the guide. Maybe I got to make this guy out of clay. Oh, a clay off. <laughs> That's not a thing, but I want it to be a thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Battling sculptures. Look. Okay. If you're also doing yours in clay, I can do a drawing of what mine's going to look like, and then we'll have the two drawings and the two clay. That's I've, a good I've idea. I've doubled our homework. Yep. Uh, I'd also like to call this challenge, sculpt this. I don't know. 
we haven't even done it and i want that a regular bit well you're gonna have the clay <laughs> i am you have to bake yeah. it in the oven it's yeah you got real clay yeah i went for it i i was googling like what's the best clay for like you know whatever i'm trying to make what's the best clay for like a beginner what's the best whatever and the answer is everyone's got a different opinion yeah so if i had just spent that time drawing i'd be done <laughs> well the time i spent preparing but did we'll you see. just take a look at his little crotch like are you seeing how cute that is okay i'll stop he's also kind of kermit the frogish i oh, i i see it sure. i see it like you know i yeah anyway look i'm going to have Another. a grand old time i'm going to try and find some time tomorrow or uh, on the weekend and the joke will be that this will become something I cannot work with and I'll lose my mind and hate myself for it. Or all of a sudden it'll spark a new hobby and everything around me will be surrounded with clay. Yeah. Well, stay tuned, dear listeners, because it's, I'll say it for the third time tonight. <laughs> it's a 50-50. I don't have time for a new hobby. None of us do. Um... I'll make our all... hobby turn into our hobby turned into a full time job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then sparked other hobbies. And if I can be good at this, I'm gonna make a clay hand that's given the finger and it's going on my front door for those fucking kids. <laughs> and that, dear listeners, is what we call a button. All right. So let's get into the episode. Uh beautifully played. Beautifully played. Now, this week we're talking about the Northern Bank robbery. I know absolutely nothing about this, and I could hey. not be more jazzed. We love a heist. We do. And this love one, a heist. great news, no disclaimer off the top. Hey. Hey. Isn't it rare for there to be a true crime case where we don't have to worry about any murders, assaults, all of the above? What a gift. Yes, there is a murder. In something else I talk about, but it's not to the point where, where yeah. we'll be fine. The point yeah. is, it's l a lot lighter than what we normally do. So that's, that's nice. Well, let's get yeah. into it. In December 2004, an unknown number of thieves walked away with 26.5 million pounds from a bank in Northern Ireland. At the time, it was the largest cash robbery in UK history. The reason that the police don't know how many thieves were involved is because despite taking the money, the thieves never actually set foot inside the bank. So how did the thieves manage to pull off the robbery without entering the bank? Have any of the thieves been captured? And what the heck is a tiger kidnapping? Christy Oxborough investigates. Yeah, I well, had I'm... never heard the term tiger kidnapping before. I haven't either. I thought it legitimately meant kidnapping a tiger. It doesn't. It does not. Okay. No I cats are that. involved. That's no the cats. Weird. Yeah, it's uh, it's weird. We get into that uh, later. But the point is, came across that this afternoon and went, what the fuck is that? Oh. Huh. Well, anyhow. So we're here to learn and you're here to teach. Yeah. Well, I said there's no disclaimer off the top, but there is a, an advance apologies. Uh, oh, sure. Mainly to our Irish listeners. Of course. Uh, for my pronunciations. Just know I genuinely am trying. And I let the internet tell me how it's said. And I listen to things online to tell me how to say certain things. And well, we're just all doing our best. So just before 10 p.m. on the night of December 19th, 2004, there was a knock at the door of Chris Ward's home in Polglass, which is in the western part of Belfast, Northern Ireland. Chris had been at home watching a football match with his father, football being soccer, of course, for our mm -hmm. North American listeners. When Chris answered the door, he saw a man he didn't recognize. The man told Chris that he was there to get tickets to the next Celtic football match. Since Chris was secretary for the Glasgow Celtic Supporters Club, as well as the person responsible for organizing tickets, this was not an unusual request. And since it was incredibly cold outside, Chris invited the man inside. But once the man stepped through the door, a second man appeared with a gun. 
the two men forced Chris into the living room where they gathered up Chris's mother, father, brother, and his brother's girlfriend. Chris later said, quote, it was just terrifying. Even the fact that they knew I was involved in Celtic, they knew where I lived, they knew my family, they knew my family's names. The family were then tied up and given what they described as a holy picture, so I assume maybe one of, of Jesus or something, uh, they were told to swear on the picture that they wouldn't cause any trouble. Chris was taken upstairs and told to pack a bag, including his work uniform. Chris, who was 24 at the time, was a supervisor at the Northern Bank. The Northern Bank was formed in 1809 and is one of the big four banks in Northern Ireland. The other three include Bank of Ireland, Allied Irish Banks, and Ulster Bank. By the early 2000s, the Northern Bank was owned by National Australia Bank and was the largest retail bank in Northern Ireland with 95 branches. The Northern Bank headquarters were at, at Donegal Square West in Belfast. In November 2012, Northern Bank became Dansk Bank. That's not overly important because this all happened before 2012, but, you know, I like to give up to date. So Chris was, after he gets his bag, he's taken outside and placed on the floor of a car. Chris is, says the driver pointed a gun at him and told him if he cooperated, he'd be fine. If he didn't, he'd be dead. Chris was then told they would be driving for about 45 minutes, so he should remain calm. Chris was then driven 20 miles, or 32 kilometers, to Lachlan Island to the home of his boss, Kevin McCullen. McMullen, sorry. Kevin, who was in his mid-30s, was a senior executive at Northern Bank. Kevin had been home watching TV with his wife, Karen, when there was a knock at their front door just before 10 p.m. When Karen answered the door, she saw two men dressed as police officers who told her that a family member had been killed in a car accident. Karen was in shock, so she let the police officers in. Once inside, they pulled a gun on Kevin and told him, cooperate or die. Jesus, this is my, this is up there in fears for me. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Karen was then forced to put on a boiler suit, which North Americans would call just like coveralls. Her hands were tied behind her back and she was blindfolded with tape wrapped around her head and then placed in her own car. Kevin later said, quote, they said they would shoot her in the head. And the phrase that was used repeatedly throughout the night was, quote, we will damage her beyond repair, which is horrifying. Yeah. Uh, Karen was then driven to a random house where she was told to go to sleep. Karen later said she was unable to sleep because she was constantly terrified that she might be raped. Throughout the night, she said she could hear plastic crinkling and she thought the armed men were getting out a body bag. Oh, my God. The absolute terror that Karen went through during this whole ordeal was inhumane. When Chris arrived at Kevin's house, he sees Kevin tied up sitting on the couch. By this point, both men and their families had been held hostage for about an hour. Both men said they were kicked repeatedly and told if they ever want to see their families again, they have to do exactly as they are told. Throughout the night, Chris and Kevin are interrogated about their roles at the bank. The armed men also asked about other staff members, the bank's overall layout, and what kind of security it had. Chris later said he was shocked by just how much information the armed men already knew about the bank. Um, he said it was like they were just confirming that their information was current and accurate, as opposed to attempting to learn something new. Around 6.30 a.m., the armed men left Chris and Kevin alone at Kevin's house. They were given cell phones and told the men would be in touch. Chris and Kevin were told to arrive at work at their scheduled time, which was noon. Hours later, both men drove to the bank in Kevin's car. But since Kevin and Chris 
didn't know each other very well. Kevin dropped Chris off a few blocks from the bank because it would have been suspicious if they had arrived together. Throughout the afternoon, both Kevin and Chris were contacted by the armed men and given instructions, such as when Kevin was told to make up an excuse and send the rest of the bank staff home three hours early. Most of the staff seemed to think it was some kind of a treat because it was just a few days before Christmas. So they were like, okay, great. And they left. Uh, Kevin later said, quote, I told them there had been a problem with the balance and myself and Chris were going to have to do a full note count. I told them they were dismissed and everyone could go home. It didn't take them very long to go. I think they were just happy to get away. At 6.19 p.m., Kevin and Chris were contacted by the armed men to tell them the staff had left. Or sorry, Kevin and Chris contacted the armed men said the staff had left, so the armed men then decided to start a test robbery. Uh-huh. Kevin and Chris were told to go to the bank vault and fill a duffel bag, or gym bag, uh, or I guess uh, there they call it a hold-all, uh, with as many 50 and 10-pound notes as they could. While the bank staff had left for the night, there were still two security guards on the premises, but Chris was able to just walk out of the building with the bag without rousing any suspicion. Chris walked out the back door, down an alleyway, until he came to a bus stop across the street. There, he was met with a man, by a man with a baseball cap who took the bag and told Chris to return to the bank and wait for further instructions. The test run managed to score about one million pounds, which is equivalent to about 1.2 million U.S. dollars. The fact that this initial robbery was a test run proves how intelligent and organized those armed men were. The Northern Bank was located right next to City Hall and just 0.5 miles or 800 meters from the Musgrave Police Station. So the armed men wanted to ensure the robbery would be successful, and once they realized no police were coming, they gave Kevin and Chris the green light to go ahead with the actual robbery. Chris returned to the bank at 6.28 p.m. Kevin and Chris were then told to fill 24 crates with 20 and 50 pound notes, put the crates onto trolleys, and then using the lift or elevator, take the crates to the loading bay. A security company named Securicor used the loading bay to deliver and collect cash from other Northern Bank branches. Kevin told the security guards in the control room that he and Chris were just doing a massive clean out, so they were going to need to take multiple trips to the garbage and bring them out to the alley uh, through the loading bay, and a removal company was going to come and they'd just fill the truck uh, up for that removal company. Security guards totally bought it, but to really help sell their story, Kevin and Chris placed broken furniture and cardboard boxes on top of the crates to disguise them. The crates were then taken outside, where two armed men were just randomly showed up. A white truck was seen on CT CCTV video at 7.01 p.m., just blocks from the bank. It arrived minutes later. And the two men who had randomly appeared in the alley loaded the crates into the back of the truck. Once the truck left, Chris was told he had 15 minutes to fill as many crates as possible with 20 pound notes for a second run. Kevin and Chris were concerned the security guards would start to get suspicious, but the guards clearly thought nothing of it because when the truck came back for a second pickup, the security guards were the ones that notified Kevin and Chris that the truck had returned. Just trying to be helpful. Yeah. But at least someone was suspicious because a couple had walked down the alley behind the bank when they noticed a white truck with two men who looked suspicious. The couple walked to the nearest cross street and then just kept walking until they found a man in uniform the first one they found was a traffic warden who called 999 at 8.13 p.m. But when the scene was checked, there was nothing out of the ordinary. 
because according to CCTV video, the truck left the alleyway at 8.12 p.m., just one minute before that 999 call was made. After the second load, technically the third if you count the trial run, Kevin and Chris were instructed to go back to the vault, clean up any evidence of a robbery, lock the doors, and set the alarm. Just after 10 p.m., they were driven back to Chris's home, where his family were still being watched by masked men. The Ward family, who had been held hostage by three masked men for about 24 hours at this point, were released unharmed. At 11 p.m., Chris did the final thing that the armed men had asked of him, and that was to call the Police Service of Northern Ireland, or PSNI. The call lasted nearly 30 minutes. Kevin noticed his wife, Karen, was not at the ward house, so he drove home to look for her. Karen was initially transferred from her house in Lachlan Island to an unlo unknown location, possibly a house. Then around 7 p.m., Karen was taken to Drumkira Forest, which is about nine miles or 15 kilometers west of Karen's house. Karen managed to make her way to a nearby house where the homeowner called 999 at 11.45 p.m. In the background of the call, Karen can be heard just fully screaming. By this point, Karen had been held blindfolded for 24 hours. Oh, my it God. Also, she was also just dumped in a dark forest. And then, like, good luck, find your own way out, that kind of thing. Uh, the only reason I bring this specific point up is because the robbery may overall seem like a victimless crime, but the pain and suffering those hostages went through, especially Karen, was just unforgivable. She was taken to a hospital where she was treated for hypothermia. Why she had to be taken out of the house and taken out left in the woods, all of those things, but yet the other family got to stay in their home, still with armed men. But why didn't they just take Karen to the house to stay with the other family? Why torture her that much more? That's a big thing for me. I have a lot of questions about this plan that they've come up with in general i'll save them till the end but it, there's a lot of questions here about like why that decision get made it feels yeah really it feels very specific yeah but also like but why is it specific like it's yeah again get that. are you targeting my house deliberately <laughs> <laughs> i had no idea that that was uh gonna connect so directly to this case but but it turns out there we are there we are, because it starts with Nicky Nicky Nine Doors and ends in bank robbery. <laughs> well, yeah. I know. I need to lighten up. Not the point. Nope. I'll lighten up when I start massaging that clay. <laughs> if you and I aren't full doing a ghost moment with some clay, I'll be sick about it. Let's get the pottery wheel. I know, right? It's, a, it's my dream. So... So Karen later told the police, quote, um, for hours, I was thinking they were going to kill me. I was waiting for a bullet in the back of my head. I asked him to get my body back to my family. Karen's car, which had been used to transport her, was later found near the forest. It had been set on fire. Yep. The entire bank robbery was caught on CCTV video. However, the footage in and around the bank was grainy and didn't help with the investigation. Plus, all of the video inside literally just shows Kevin and Chris fully stealing the money. There was also no security cameras in the loading bay, which feels interesting. And since the armed men didn't actually set foot inside the bank, police had no forensic evidence either. Even when it came to the home of Chris and Kevin, the armed men used bleach and essentially just left zero traces of themselves behind. Any cups they used, they took them with them. The Northern Bank knew that it was vulnerable to a robbery as they had recently cut their security budget by a third and had started outsourcing their security to a private company. In total, 
The armed men got away with 26.5 million pounds, which is equivalent to 32.4 million U.S. dollars. At the time, it was the biggest cash robbery in U.K. history. However, it was surpassed 14 months later after a group of armed men stole 53 million pounds from the Securitas Bank in Tunbridge, England. For more on that heist, check out the upcoming Last Call episode over on Patreon. Do I normally say what I'm going to talk about on a Patreon episode in advance? No. I just didn't want anyone to think I was going to mention a heist of that magnitude without giving any details whatsoever about it. So that's a fun in advance for people because this will come out before that episode comes there out. There you go. If I've done the math right, and I might not have. So from the $26.5 million that was stolen from the Northern Bank, $16.5 million were in brand new notes. Nine million were in 20 pound notes and 7.5 million were in 10 pound notes. This means the bank had a list of the serial numbers on all of the new bills, meaning there were that more than half of the score would have been very difficult for them to get rid of. Because, of course, once a robbery, they're going to put out those serial numbers and using getting rid of that money is going to be very difficult but that left them with 10 million in older money that was untraceable 5.5 million of that money was old northern banknotes and 4.5 million were in notes from other banks and in other currencies like us dollars and euros so that would be much easier that's untraceable they can do whatever they want with that that is, until March 2005, less than three months after the robbery, when the Northern Bank announced their decision to replace all the current notes with new notes featuring different colors and a new logo. Meaning, all the old notes would be pulled from circulation, and if anyone had old notes, they'd be required to go to a bank to swap them for new ones. So if you were sitting on, say, roughly $10 million in stolen old notes, you'd have to risk taking a lot of suspicious trips to the bank to get new notes so your money would still be worth something. And for those who may be questioning the bank's decision to change their bank notes entirely, yes, in most countries, there is a set currency that gets printed and then distributed to all the banks in that country. But in Northern Ireland, the four main banks which again include Bank of Ireland, Ulster Bank, Allied Irish Banks, and the Northern Bank, they each print their own notes. So by stealing from the Northern Bank, really only Northern Bank notes were affected um, by the change of you know printing their own. It was estimated that at the time there were 300 million worth of Northern Bank notes in circulation at the time of the robbery, to replace all of those notes completely was going to cost the bank about £5 million. According to the chief of police, thanks to this move by the Northern Bank, quote, the robbery has now become the biggest theft of waste paper in the living history of Northern Ireland. This is incredible. I guess in their minds, it was like, well, if it costs us five million, that's a heck of a lot less than the twenty six million that was taken. So, yeah, we got to cut our losses. This once again, move. feeling like since these robbers ended up essentially with nothing, um, some men just like to watch the world burn <laughs> yet again. These themes, yeah. Well, listen, uh, let's take a quick break. Let's hit the can. Let's grab another drink. I highly suggest some Gatorade and vodka if you've got it on you. And we'll be right back with more on the Northern Bank heist, Northern Bank robbery, excuse me, on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Clap two on three. One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing the Northern Bank robbery. Or the break, Christy took us through the crime now let's go through the time. I don't, that's yeah. not necessary. No, I like that a lot. Um, what you missed 
in that moment. Oh, for those who don't watch the video, uh, we do a clap for the audio sake. I missed my hands. Wowzer. Like I, I did like a, I went and I kind of did like one of these where I just yep. barely just kissed it. Like that was embarrassing. Well, I never would have known if you hadn't told me. Oh, but now it's on, it's on film. It's on film. It's film. Not on... <laughs> it's a beautiful film. Oh. Yeah. Well, oh, when we, God, um, when it. we take this film and develop it and then start cutting it into the episode, I'll make sure to take that bit out. I'll leave it on the floor. Thank you so much. Oh, don't even tempt them with things getting edited into the video. Cause yeah, I didn't even have time for arts and crafts this week. Look, we, we can't add anything else. We can't to our plates. No, no, it's a lot. Uh, yep. But so with a heist that at the time was the largest cash robbery in UK history, did police have any suspects in mind? Well, according to Hugh Ord, the chief from the Police Service of Northern Ireland, or PSNI, he believed he knew exactly who was responsible. Hugh was told if he was going to announce publicly who the suspect was, he needed to be pretty damn sure because his job was on the line. And so during a press conference on January 7th, just 18 days after the robbery, Hugh announced, and I quote, on the basis of the investigative work we have done to date, the evidence we have collected, in my opinion, uh, the provisional IRA was responsible for this crime and all main lines of inquiry currently undertaken are in that direction. The rumor was that the IRA had stolen the money to use it as a retirement fund for IRA loyalists. That rumor has never been proven. The IRA responded to Hugh Ord's statement two weeks later, saying, quote, We restate our commitment to the peace process, but we will not submit to a process of humiliation, which is one of the more serious things, uh, but somehow it made me laugh. It shouldn't have. Um, also, for anyone watching the video, yeah, my ring light died in the middle of that. So it's darker over here. It's fine it's fine i just have to plug it in i'm just not going to bother i'm just going to waste time talking about it i like that ding -a -ling. so there <laughs> this is putting it mildly but there is a lot of history with the irish republican army also known as the ira we don't have time to touch on everything but for the sake of the heist the investigators' strong belief that the IRA was behind it and the political ramifications, whether they committed the crime or not, I need to give a very brief overview of the IRA. Again, yes, things are going to be left out and people are going to be like, but you didn't talk about this. I know. It's, it's a very lengthy thing. We could do podcasts about it. We don't have time. No. Anyhow. So, in April 1916, 1,200 Irish nationalists launched an armed revolt against British rule in Ireland. It was later called the Easter Rising. The nationalists issued a written proclamation demanding the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland. This fight lasted seven days and resulted in 485 deaths with more than 2,200 people being wounded. It led to the 1918 landslide victory of the Irish Nationalist Party, forgive me, uh, Sinn Féin, uh, as well as to the eventual separation of Ireland, uh, which I'll get to. The hope of making Ireland an independent republic, free from British rule, grew more powerful with the 1919 formation of the Republican paramilitary organization called the IRA. And if we're going to talk IRA, we have to mention Michael Collins, who was played ever so coolly by who we wish was friend of the podcast, Liam Neeson. 
in a 1996 movie. And I'm just manifesting. If I say he's friend of the podcast, it just means we like him enough to be friends. Hell yeah. And we're willing. So, uh, so Michael Collins was the IRA's director of intelligence who led the IRA to use guerrilla tactics to force the British government to negotiate during the Anglo-Irish War. Collins went to London in July 1921 to negotiate a truce. Six months later, he signed a treaty which gave the 26 counties of Ireland, known as the Irish Free State, dominion status within the British Empire, meaning that they could be self-governing. The six counties of Northern Ireland remained part of the UK. Collins believed that this was the best they could do for Ireland at the time. Many IRA members were kind of livid about it. This led to the Irish Civil War in June 1922, during which Collins was murdered in an ambush in West Cork. He was 31 years old uh, at the time of his death. The IRA continued to push for a united Republican Ireland, and in 1931, the organization was declared illegal. For some reason or another, it was declared illegal a second time in 1936. During World War II, the IRA asked Hitler to help them remove the British from Ireland. Oh! Five IRA leaders were executed for that decision. Oh my god. Uh, so, you know. Uh, so Ireland withdrew from the British Commonwealth in 1949, so the IRA then sets its sights on unifying the predominantly Protestant North Ireland with the predominantly Roman Catholic Irish Republic. After decades of violence and infighting, in December 1969, the IRA kind of split into two factions, the official and the provisional. While both were still committed to a united Irish public, the official believed it could be achieved through parliamentary tactics. And after 1972, they no longer supported violent acts to become unified. The Provisionals, uh, however, also known as the Provost, believed violence was the only way to achieve their end goal. So in 1970, the Provost started carrying out assassinations, ambushes, bombings in what they called the Long War. It's estimated that between 1969 and 1994, the IRA was responsible for the deaths of 1,800 people, which included 600 civilians. Support for the IRA increased when the British started arresting anyone suspected of IRA involvement. On January 30th, 1972, British paratroopers opened fire on a group of unarmed civilians who were participating in a civil rights march in Derry in Northern Ireland. 13 people were killed and 15 more were wounded. The incident would be later referred to as Bloody Sunday. This led to a surge of hundreds of new IRA members. In 2010, a report officially declared that none of those 13 victims had been a threat and a reminder that they were all completely unarmed. So, less than six months after that shooting, secret peace talks took place between the IRA and the British government, which was the first time the two groups had willingly met since 1921. Two weeks later, the IRA set off more than 20 bombs in Belfast, killing nine people and wounding 130 more. The incident would later re be referred to as Bloody Friday. Ten days later, the British retaliated by bringing tanks into IRA-controlled areas. This led to the IRA taking their attacks to Britain's mainland in a conflict referred to as the Troubles. Which, you know, would continue for another, I don't know, 30-ish years? In November 1974, the IRA set off bombs in Birmingham, England, in two pubs that were known to be popular with off-duty police officers, 21 people were killed, another 182 were wounded. 1974 proved to be the deadliest year in the long-running conflict between the IRA and Britain, 
Nearly 500 people were killed, including hundreds of civilians. The year ended with a Christmas ceasefire and more secret peace talks. However, the truce ended in March 1975 when the IRA declared, quote, we achieve more in wartime than in peacetime. In August 1979, the IRA ambushed a British Army convoy with two roadside bombs outside Warren Point, Northern Ireland. 18 soldiers were killed. More than 20 other people were wounded. That same day, a member of the IRA placed a 50-pound bomb on a boat belonging to Louis Mountbatten, cousin of Queen Elizabeth II, Louis, his 14-year-old grandson, an 83-year-old woman, and a teenage crew member were all killed. The three other people on board were seriously wounded, but did survive. In March 1981, IRA member Bobby Sands started a hunger strike that lasted for 66 days, resulting in the deaths of 10 prisoners, seven of which were IRA members. Then in November 1985, the Irish and British prime ministers signed the Anglo-Irish Agreement, which states that both governments would consult together on Northern Ireland with the hope of uniting the nation. But 18 months later, eight IRA members bombed the police station in Logal. Half of the base was destroyed in the blast. There were no casualties. But I think the, the British knew that was going to happen because the British Army's Special Air Service was kind of ready to go and quickly ambushed them, and all I eight IRA members were killed, as well as a civilian. When it was discovered that two of those IRA members were unarmed at the time, it caused another surge of new IRA recruits. Exactly six months later, the IRA set off bombs meant to kill police officers at a war memorial service in Enniskillen. Eleven civilians were killed and another 63 were injured. In August 1994, after months of secret peace talks, the IRA agrees to a ceasefire on all military activities. But they ended the ceasefire 17 months later in February 1996 when they detonated a 3,000-pound bomb in the Docklands area of London. The blast caused 150 million pounds in damage, and despite the IRA giving a 90-minute warning prior to the attack, two people were killed and 40 more were wounded. Over a year later, in September 1997, Britain openly met with members of the Irish Nationalist Party Sinn Féin for the first formal peace talks since 1922. This eventually led to the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in April 1998. This was a huge moment which earned both the leader of the Protestant Ulster Unionist Party and the leader of the Social Democratic Labour Party a Nobel Peace Prize. Wow. And the reason this agreement seemed so successful was the fact that a large percent of the population in Northern Ireland kind of, at the time, wanted to remain in the UK. The agreement stated that Northern Ireland would be self-governed by an assembly of 108 electric, elected officials. However, not everyone was happy about it. Part of the population was more interested in unifying Ireland than being part of the UK. That includes a small member or a small group of the IRA who were angry enough they set off a car bomb in Oma, Northern Ireland. The blast killed 29 people and wounded another 200. To this day, it was the deadliest single paramilitary attack in the history of Northern Ireland. As part of the agreement, all paramilitary groups, including the IRA, were supposed to be fully disarmed by May 2001, or sorry, by May 2000. And the Independent International Commission on Decommissioning was created specifically to monitor the process and make sure that these groups actually disarmed. The IRA started the dearming process 
in October 2001. The fact that they were supposed to be done by May 2000 and they were like, we'll start later, um, speaks volumes. Uh, in July 2005, the IRA announced that they had finished. They released a statement saying, quote, all IRA units have been ordered to dump arms. All volunteers have been instructed to assist the development of purely political and democratic programs through exclusively peaceful means. Volunteers must not engage in any other activities whatsoever. And while the peace process seemed to be going well, there were, of course, conflicts and incidents throughout this decommissioning process that threatened everything, such as a group of 15 provisional IRA members kidnapping, torturing, and killing two people in September 2001, uh, the potential IRA involvement in the Northern Bank robbery in December 2004, and the murder of Robert McCartney in January 2005, which leads me to a Robert McCartney side note. Yes. So, on the night of January 30th, 2005, Robert McCartney was out for drinks at the McGinnis Bar in Belfast. He got into an altercation with some men after... Uh, they haven't really, no one's really fully said, but the idea was that Robert may or may not have made a rude gesture or made a rude comment towards the wife of an IRA member. It's more than possible it didn't even happen. No one's ever fully said. So a fight breaks out. Robert gets attacked with a broken bottle and then gets dragged out into the street where these men start beating him with metal bars and stabbing him. Hours later, Robert was discovered unconscious by a police officer out on patrol. He was taken to a hospital where he died the following morning. He was just 33 years old. Now, my apologies for this brief moment because it is graphic, but Robert had his throat cut, an eye removed, and a cut from his chest down through his stomach. Robert's friend Brendan was also injured in the attack, including his throat being slashed, but he managed to survive. When police arrived at the scene to investigate, a group of locals started attacking the officers, forcing them to pull back and delay the investigation. But before the police were able to make it back, the CCTV tapes were removed from the bar and the bar staff were threatened. Despite the murder happening, just outside the bar, no one called for an ambulance. And when police asked for witnesses, miraculously, none of the 70 people present at the bar that night saw a thing. Most of them even claimed they were in the bathroom at the time the incident occurred. Jerry Adams, the president of Sinn Féin, urged people to come forward, but no one did. In response... Jerry suspended 12 members of the party. Two weeks after the murder, the IRA issued a statement denying any involvement. Then two weeks after that, the IRA issues another statement. This time, they admit, we know who did it. Four of our members were responsible. Then they had, in this statement, that was public. They admit, they had a meeting with Robert's family. They told them the details that they had learned of the crime, uh, like how the fight started in the bar and spilled out onto the street with a crowd following. And one of the attackers got a knife from the kitchen inside the bar. One man stabbed Robert and his friend Brendan. Another man kicked and beat Robert before yet another man hit Robert with a steel bar. The man who stole the knife also took the CCTV tapes from the bar and destroyed them. He then also burned all of the clothes that all of the attackers were wearing that night. The IRA then told Robert's family that not only did they know the identity of Robert's attackers, but they were prepared to shoot those who were directly involved if that's what the family wanted. Again, this was in a public statement we told the family we know who was responsible. We offered to kill them. The family said no. I, 
I just... To tell a victim's family you know who the killer is and then to offer to kill them is wild to me. Especially the fact that they so publicly admitted that. They were like, we, we could have. They didn't want us to. What more do you want? It's like, I just can't wrap my brain around that. Um, but Robert's five sisters worked tirelessly to get justice for their brother, including going to Washington to speak with then President George W. Bush. In 2008, three men went on trial in connection with Robert's murder, but they were all acquitted. Robert's family believed the provisional IRA commander Gerard Davison known as Jock, was responsible for Robert's murder. But after Jock's own murder in May 2015, Robert's family now considers the case to be closed. So the conflict between July 1969 and December 2001 result resulted in the deaths of nearly 3,600 people, as well as injuries to more than 45,000. So it kind of makes sense that the why the peace talks would be important and why a senseless murder like that of Robert McCartney might threaten the work the peace talks were trying to do. So I find it incredibly bold for a police chief to publicly blame the provisional IRA for the Northern Bank robbery when he did so without any evidence whatsoever and just barely after the crime had happened. But the police weren't the only ones to assume that the IRA was involved in the robbery. On February 10th, the Independent Monitoring Commission released a report on the robbery stating they believed the IRA was responsible for the Northern Bank robbery, as well as multiple other crimes, including a robbery at a shop in Strabane, Strab Strabane? Mm. Uh, on September 26, 2004, uh, the robbery of two million pounds worth of cigarettes from a delivery truck in Belfast, October 2nd, 2004. Uh, in the commission's report, they also recommended that the political party Sinn Féin be fined for authorizing the robbery. They had no proof that they authorized the robbery, but I like that they're like, they should be fined for that. Well, you don't have proof they did it. Um, but the quote from the report the leadership and rank and file of Sinn Féin need to make the choice between continued association with and support for provisional IRA criminality and the path of exclusively democratic political party. Founded in 1905, Sinn Féin is an Irish political party that leans towards republicanism. Its name in Gaelic means we ourselves. Uh, as the main goal of the party has always been to break the connection with England, which they consider to be the source of their political evils and to assert independence of their own country. Many consider Sinn Féin to be the political wing of the IRA. Sinn Féin says that they are not the IRA. They are totally separate. So when the commission's report called out Sinn Féin as being involved, they took it personally. Uh, their official, Martin McGuinness, said the accusation that they were involved in any way was, quote, nothing more than politically biased allegations. The, prov the provisional IRA also responded to the commission's report by saying, again, the IRA was not involved in that bank robbery in any way. Let it go. So everyone seems to think, everyone except for the IRA, that is, they all seem to think the IRA was involved. So the question is, were they? Well, shortly after the Northern Bank robbery, the PSNI, Police Service of Northern Ireland, set up an investigation that included 50 detectives. And right away, a senior officer told the Guardian newspaper, quote, this operation required great expertise, coordination, probably more than the loyalist gangs possess which is a lot of shade for uh, for someone. Uh, it could also just be maybe like a reverse psychology, hoping that by insulting them, they'd come forward to be like, we are smart. 
it absolutely was a you know what i mean yeah um well on february 10th 2005 the same day that independent monitoring commission released their report the psni searched two houses belonging to a set of brothers near borough county tyrone it was never stated why those houses were searched but nothing was found linking either brother to the robbery then a week later the garda or police force in Ireland, did a series of raids in Dublin and Cork. This resulted in the arrest of seven people and the recovery of over two million pounds. 60,000 of those pounds were in northern banknotes. But of course, they don't know for sure if they're some of the notes that were stolen or not. Garda Commissioner Neil Conroy wouldn't say if the raids were connected to the Northern Bank robbery or not. He stated it was all part of an investigation into money laundering. And then he publicly said the IRA is absolutely behind all of this. The identities of the seven people arrested were not made public, but each of those seven people were questioned and then released without charge. Two of those who were arrested were members of Sinn Féin, so the party responded to the arrests with a statement saying, quote, Sinn Féin's position on this robbery is clear. Over the last four weeks, we have seen people rush to judgment time and time again. We would urge people to exercise caution on this occasion and allow the truth to come out. Again, Sinn Féin says it's nothing like not connected in any way to the IRA, but anytime the IRA gets in trouble, they're like, guys, stop blaming the IRA. Because we might be linked, but we're not, you know. It gets very confusing at times, but, you know. So on the same day as the raids that got seven people arrested, the police discover 50,000 pounds in new northern banknotes in a bathroom at the New Forge Country Club in Belfast. The club is the police's own sports and social club. So the police claimed that it was an elaborate prank aimed at directing attention away from the events elsewhere. They say it was done to cast doubt on the police. I'm sure that's true. But we can't forget the fact that two of the thieves dressed as police officers when approaching the home of Kevin McMullen. And while it is more than possible those uniforms were fake, it's also possible the uniforms were real. Maybe some of the thieves were actual police officers, or maybe someone within the police force was simply paid to get uniforms for the actual thieves. Just speculating. So throughout 2005, the investigation into the Northern Bank robbery resulted in 22 searches and 13 arrests. Of course, as I just mentioned, more than half those arrests resulted in the person not or just being released without charge. So we're going to look at some of the arrests that actually involved charges. On February 17th, 2005, Garda searched the home of 58-year-old Ted Cunningham in Farron, County Cork. Ted was a financial advisor and money lender at a company called Chesterton Finance. In Ted's basement, the Garda discovered one plastic bag and six duffel bags, or holdalls, which contained a total of 2.4 million pounds. Within days, four men individually approached the police and surrendered a total of 400,000 pounds that they claimed Ted had given them for safekeeping. Ted, of course, denies this, but he was arrested and charged with money laundering. During his 10-week trial in early 2009, it was revealed that Ted had initially told police he met with a man who Ted refused to identify, the man gave Ted $4.9 million from the Northern Bank robbery with the plan that Ted would launder the money for him. Ted said, quote, I saw Northern Sterling. 
it did I didn't count it at that stage. I wasn't a fool. When I saw Northern notes, I knew what it was. I suspected it was from the Northern bank job. Ted later claimed this statement was false and that he only made it while under duress. He said he was sleep deprived and the police had threatened to publicly claim that Ted had revealed the name of the names of IRA members, which according to Ted is something that would have got him killed. In March, 2009, Ted Cunningham was found guilty on 10 counts of money laundering and sentenced to 10 years. But in May 2012, Ted appealed and his conviction was thrown out because the search warrant that was initially used to search his home in 2005 was invalid because it was issued by a senior Garda officer in charge of the investigation. I don't know why it would be invalid because of that maybe because it wasn't issued by a judge i don't know if that's how they work over there or not uh but this meant a retrial for ted cunningham in february 2014 ted then pleaded guilty to two counts of money laundering saying he laundered approximately 275 thousand pounds he received a five-year suspended sentence and was able to completely avoid prison because he was in poor health. Ted was then banned from working at any financial institution. In 2019, Ted went to the High Court in Dublin to appeal for a review as to what happened to the money that was seized from his home in 2005. Ted claimed he wasn't asking because he wanted the money back. He was just simply asking for proof of where it had gone. The nearly three million pounds in question had been forfeited. To the state. But can you imagine having the kind of money and time to be like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sue and get in there just to ask about the money. I don't want it. I'm not asking for me. I'm asking for you. Like that's such a weird. <laughs> yeah. It just feels okay, sir. It's it feels very because I'm hoping you're gonna say I can have it back. Yeah. Is kind of how it seems to me. So, Ted's 33-year-old son, Timothy Cunningham, also pleaded guilty to one count of money laundering. He even outright admitted he knew the money he was given had come from the Northern Bank robbery. Timothy was given a three-year suspended sentence, as the judge said it was clear that Timothy had been acting under the influence and direction of his father. Ted denied any personal involvement in the Northern Bank robbery, but he did admit the millions of pounds discovered in his home came from the robbery. Ted claimed the real mastermind behind that robbery was Phil Flynn, who at the time was the chairman of the Bank of Scotland, Ireland. Phil was also a member, he'd also been a member of Sinn Féin since he was 14 years old, and he was their vice president from 1980 to 1987. Phil denied any involvement in money laundering of any kind and claims the Irish police were just conspiring to frame him. But insiders who knew Phil personally said that Phil was allegedly the head of money laundering in Sinn Féin. Yep. The insiders also described Phil as the heart of the empire or the heart of the enterprise and, quote, an enemy of the state, which is interesting because Phil was also an advisor to Bertie Ahern, who at the time was the uh, prime minister of Ireland and also a peace negotiator. So it's interesting that he, his advisor was an enemy of the state, but or described as, I should say. So Ted Cunningham even claimed at the time of his arrest that he and Phil Flynn were in the process of setting up a bank in Bulgaria. In fact, Ted was claiming now, wait a minute, no, the money actually didn't come from the bank robbery. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, It actually came from my business dealings in Bulgaria. I know. 
Records show that Ted did give 58,000 euros to a solicitor in Bulgaria for the purpose of setting up a company in that country. Um, that doesn't explain why he would have millions in his basement hidden away. Uh, but during his trial, Ted claimed he'd been asked to launder the money by a man who he refused to identify. At the time, Ted said he feared for his safety and the safety of his family. Ted has since uh, previously, or Ted, Ted has since said that previously unnamed man that he was afraid of was Phil Flynn. As of October 2023, Phil has never been charged uh, with anything connected to money laundering or the Northern Bank robbery, and Ted is currently seeking damages for what he claims was wrongful conviction and imprisonment. So I guess good luck to Ted on that. Um, so more arrests from the investigation. On February 18th, 2005, Garda arrested 51-year-old Don Blaney, who had been seen by neighbors burning Northern banknotes in his backyard in Passage West Cork. While at his home, Garda discovered burnt banknotes in Don's chimney, as well as a Kalashnikov assault rifle and 220 rounds of ammunition. Don was released without charge regarding the money. However, in 2009, he was convicted on a weapons charge for that rifle and sentenced to two years in jail. In early November 2005, police made five arrests in the span of 36 hours. It included Dominic McAvoy, Martin Michaliski, Mika, hmm, Mikal, hmm, Brian Arthurs, and Don Bullman. 23-year-old Dominic McAvoy was arrested at his home in Kelku. Dominic had been charged with possessing a firearm and falsely imprisoning Kevin McMullen and his wife Karen on the night of the robbery. He was the first person to appear in court on charges of participating in the Northern Bank robbery. Dominic, of course, denied any involvement and even went so far as to state he was not a member of the IRA. I, I don't believe they asked, but that says a lot about what the rumor was about who may or may not have been involved. Yes. A uh, 42-year-old... Oh, sorry. Skip that. There we go. Police found Dominic's DNA on a hat outside of the McMullen's home after their abduction. However, the hat also contained DNA from other unknown people, and McAvoy's DNA was too low quality to be used in court. So due to a lack of evidence, the charges against him were dropped in January 2007. 42-year-old Martin Michaliski, a car salesman from Coal Island County, Martin was charged with withholding information from the police and making false statements to investigators regarding the white vehicle used during the robbery. Just like Dominic McAvoy, charges were dropped against him in January 2007. And 40, 40 year old Brian Arthurs was from Dungannon. He was arrested in connection with the Northern Bank robbery, although they never publicly stated what the charges actually were. It was suggested he was arrested simply for his connections to the Sinn Fein party. The charges were eventually dropped. But Brian, back in May 1995, Brian was convicted on two counts of possessing explosives, stemming back from a July 1993 arrest. He was sentenced to two terms of 25 years, which were meant to run concurrently. Brian was given an early release in 2000 as part of the Good Friday Agreement from 1998. So that's a man that got two 25-year sentences and was released after five. Brian's brother, Declan Arthurs, was among the eight-man IRA unit that was killed in an ambush after bombing the police station in Logal in 1987. Unrelated, Brian 
and his wife, Paula, pleaded guilty in January 2013 to three charges of obtaining a money transfer by deception and two counts of possessing over 31,000 pounds worth of criminal property. Turns out the couple had filed three fraudulent mortgage applications totaling more than 345,000 pounds. On the applications, Brian had inflated his income by like 34,000 pounds. He also claimed he had a second job and zero debt. Another man arrested in November 2005 was a 30-year-old chef from County Cork named Don Bullman. When Don was arrested outside a Houston train station, police discovered a Daz laundry powder box in Don's backpack. Hidden at the bottom of the box, wrapped in cling film or plastic wrap, whatever you'd like to call it, was a stack of more than 67,000 pounds. The money was said to have been laundered from the Northern Bank robbery loot. Hiding laundered money in a box of laundry soap is a level of creativity that I can't be helped help but be so fucking charmed by but since there's no proof that where that money came from don was only charged with being a member of the ira which was illegal at the time in march 2007 don was convicted and sentenced to four years in may 2009 two more arrests were made in a cross-border investigation that was called operation phoenix Sinn Féin members, 42-year-old Tom Hanlon and 62-year-old George Hegarty, were arrested in Cork on charges of money laundering and simply being members of the IRA. Tom's fingerprints were found on one of the bags of money that was seized from the home of Ted Cunningham. However, there wasn't enough evidence to connect Tom to the robbery but when police searched Tom's home, they found documents and a checkbook that linked Tom to Sinn Féin and the IRA. Tom was convicted of being a member of the IRA and sentenced to three years and three months. George admitted to possessing 66,000 pounds of the stolen Northern Bank money. He pleaded guilty to money laundering and was sentenced to six years. Now, of all the arrests made in the case of the Northern Bank robbery. The most shocking one of all to me was that of Chris Ward. I knew it. The very same Chris Ward, who was abducted from his own home and forced to participate in the robbery while his family was being held at gunpoint. Given the thieves' detailed knowledge of the bank, police started to believe the heist may have been an inside job, especially since Chris did not always have a key to the vault, but he was scheduled to be a key holder on the day of the crime. The thieves clearly knew the schedule going into the robbery, so they how did they know who would have that keys that day and who wouldn't? But if they believed the thieves had inside information, then why immediately blame only Chris? What about Kevin? I'm not suggesting either were involved. I'm just saying, when the thieves take two men hostage, why are the police quick to blame only one of those two men? According to the police, they were suspicious of Chris's actions, both on the days leading up to the crime, as well as on the actual day. Police were also suspicious of Chris's rota. For those who are unaware, because I certainly was, a rota is a schedule that lists which employee will do what job and what when they'll do it, essentially. Police claimed Chris changed his rota at the last minute so he would be the one with a key to the vault on the night of the robbery. There was zero other evidence that Chris was involved. But for the police, this suspicious rota activity was enough to arrest Chris on December 7, 2005. He was charged with false imprisonment and robbery. On the same day, police searched Chris's home, finding no evidence of the Northern Bank robbery. Then Chris was held in custody for eight days, which is highly unusual, and the length of time normally reserved for terrorists. 
During those eight days, Chris claims he was interviewed approximately 50 times. Chris denies any involvement in the planning of the crime. Chris later said, quote, police have bugged my house, a holiday in Spain, went through all my phone records, my bank records, hounded my friends, even going as far as Australia. They've tortured my family in an attempt to frame me. Chris was released on bail leading up to a trial, which started on September 9th, 2008. The prosecution's main evidence against Chris was that claim he purposely changed his rota at the last minute so he would have access to a key to the bank vault. However, it was quickly determined during the trial that Chris didn't personally change his rota, and the change was due to, quote, the result of a chance decision by management. And to that I say, was there not a way to figure that out before going through the trouble of a trial? I mean, the trial... That's a great question. The trial um, didn't have a jury. So I guess the silver lining is they didn't waste 12 more people's time. The trial was expected to last eight weeks, but due to a lack of evidence, it ended after about four. And in October 2008, Chris was acquitted on all counts. All right. Well, I was wrong. Well, I've just now thought in the moment, what if whoever, whatever management changed it, what if it was that person? Or so what that if that was just a part of the deal and they were working together? I'm not, I mean, I'm speculating. I'm speculating. We're just, we're just whiteboarding. I just said, do. I said early on, I was like, <laughs> which is not me questioning. I'm not victim. This isn't me attacking victims. I'm simply saying when there's huge question marks like this, it wouldn't shock me, you know. Sure. You got to investigate everyone. It seems as though if he's been acquitted that there isn't the evidence there. But yeah, it, does that mean that absolutely no one from inside the bank was involved? No. Oh, I'm sure they had somebody. We just don't know who that somebody was. Yeah. Uh, Chris said his next plan is to take the Northern Bank to an industrial tribunal for wrongful termination because he was fired because of the arrest. Right. So, understood. Now, since most of the people arrested throughout this investigation have been released without charge and no one has been successfully charged with the actual robbery, does now retired former police chief Hugh Ord still believe the IRA was involved? Well, in recent interviews, Hugh says there is not a doubt in his mind that members of the IRA were responsible for that robbery. And while a few IRA members have been found in possession of a lot of cash, it can't be determined where that specific cash came from. So for now, the IRA's possible involvement in this crime is just a speculation. But a former member of the IRA certainly isn't helping them look innocent. In 2018, Richard Ora released a novel called Northern Heist. And while it is a work of fiction, it tells the story of a bank robbery with details very similar to that of the Northern Bank Heist. In Richard's book, the crime is committed by a criminal gang from Belfast, and once the IRA hears about it, they demand a cut of the proceeds. The book features money laundering, kidnapping, drug deals, and double crosses. Some have speculated Richard's book is based on the crime because he had insider information. Um, when outright asked about the IRA's involvement in the robbery, Richard said, quote, do I think the IRA did it? Yes. I don't think any other organization out there was capable of it. But Richard reminds us that his book is just a work of fiction about a bank robber named Ructions O'Hare. <laughs> yep. Who steals millions from a northern bank, which sounds nothing like a man named Richard O'Ra, who literally stole money from a northern bank. Because in 1977, Richard and a friend robbed a branch of the northern bank near Belfast. They got away with 11,000 pounds, 
but were caught a few hours later. Richard was sentenced to eight years in May's prison, where he became the public relations officer for the IRA during the 1981 hunger strikes. Richard was released in 1983 when he took a leadership role in the Sinn Féin party. But two years later, Richard's wife gave him an ultimatum, his family or the Republican movement. Richard said without hesitation he chose his family and never looked back. So according to Richard, he was stopped he stopped being a member of the IRA decades before the heist. So maybe the book is partially based on his own robbery in 1977. But in that robbery, Richard and a friend literally walked into a bank with weapons, told the staff to empty the tills, and then they walked out. The Northern Bank robbery and the robbery that Richard wrote about in his book Northern Heist both feature highly complex plans that involve tiger kidnapping. What is tiger kidnapping? I'm so glad you asked. According to Crime Museum, tiger kidnapping is an act that pairs a kidnapping with a second illegal activity. The purpose of the kidnapping is then to coerce an individual or group into perpetrating a crime. Basically, it forces an innocent third party to partake in something high risk and illegal, like how the Northern Bank robbers kidnapped Chris Ward and Kevin McMullen and forced them to rob a bank or risk something happening to their families. It is a term I had never heard before this case. I am fascinated by it. Um, apparently it's tiger because something about tigers stalk their prey before going in for the kill. I don't know. Um, many tiger kidnappings are not reported because the victims themselves are concerned because essentially they are, com they are guilty of committing a crime. And do you know where the idea of tiger kidnappings originated? With the IRA. <laughs> The earliest recorded tiger kidnapping took place in the early 1970s, and sadly, the popularity of the crime increased through the 1980s and became the main tactic used by criminal organizations in the UK and Ireland. Irish Parliament member Charlie Flanagan reported that not only were tiger kidnappings still a thing in Ireland, but in 2009, they were happening nearly once a week, which is horrifying to think about. Uh, the 1995 movie Nick of Time features a, ki a tiger kidnapping in which Johnny Depp's daughter is kidnapped and won't be released unless Johnny Depp murders the governor of California, who was a woman. And I'm just like, fuck, leave the woman in charge. Anyhow. Real-life examples of tiger kidnapping include the 2009 robbery of, a bank, of the Bank of Ireland and, of course, the 2004 Northern Bank robbery. Police claim they were able to track some of the stolen money, saying that it had been sent south of the border to Ireland within 48 hours of the heist. The Irish Garda raided two homes in Dublin, but no sign of the money was found. During a Garda raid in Cork, police found a bin full of half-burned northern notes. For the most part, though, the majority of that 26.5 million pounds has never been found. As of October 2023, no one has been convicted of carrying out the Northern Bank robbery. So the case officially remains unsolved. Reporting for True Crime and Cocktails... I'm Christy Oxbro. Wowzer. What an informative romp. <laughs> My God. Listen, let's take one more break, hit the can, grab another drink, and we're going to be right back to wrap it up on the Northern Bank robbery episode of True Crime and Cocktails. All right. Final clap on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing Northern Bank robbery. My notes are unhinged. I'm going to be completely honest with all of you. I've had a very <laughs> stiff drink. I'm on my second, and we're going to see what I wrote down. Good for you. Thank you very much. 
Um, the details of this crime are chilling to me. The idea of a police officer coming to your home and then it's a bad guy in a costume makes me sick. It yes. makes me absolutely sick. Um, the the detail that these people were held hostage for so long, it's just, it's too much. Uh, the fact that they took Karen to a random house, told her to sleep, of course she was afraid to go to sleep. I, I, how could you sleep? I, I think that that's a, that's a situation for me where not for a million bucks, you know? Yeah. Oh, I get that. The, the details of this are fascinating. The fact that no one thought it was weird that all the staff was getting sent home. I'm not saying that's impossible. It's just interesting. The fact that the security guards were never kind of alarmed as to what was happening. It's just interesting. Again, I'm not suggesting that that means anything. It's just fascinating to me that this all went on in plain sight. Um, I'm sorry. The term hold all is the cutest thing I've ever heard in my life. Because it's that's what it does. It holds it all. Yeah. I, will, I won't lie. I watched a documentary and they were like, oh, we found it in like six hold alls. And I was like, pardon? And I like wrote that down and highlighted it with like a look into that. What does that mean? Like, and then, well, yeah, it makes sense. Hold all. That makes sense. Duffel. What the fuck's a duffel? Oh, I don't know. Every day I'm duffeling. I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> if, if you're up the duff, you're pregnant. So then is it supposed to be like a pregnancy bag? I don't know. And then I also say gym bag, exclusionary. Some of us don't go. <laughs> <laughs> 100% of this podcast. Yes. <laughs> 100% go. of these podcast hosts do not go to the gym. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Not interested. Okay. Um, uh, great call. Gym right? bag. You know, like backpack makes sense because it's on your back. Yep. Um, yeah. Duffel. I never once considered that. Up the duff. Yep. I have not heard that. I once heard a, a, a newfie tell me she was up the stump. Up the stump. Wow. And, uh, yeah, that was that was me going, I don't know what that means. And then she had to explain it further. But um, I don't know if I've heard up the duff. I like I it. I want to say I'm right. Oh, I think I'm not I'm saying right. you're wrong. I'm a sheltered woman. <laughs> so I'm not surprised. That I'm I've just never... Googling it really quick. Sure. It looks like he's got her up the duff pregnant. Yes. Okay, great. Whew. Listen, I question myself at all turns because there is a very big possibility that I conflated oh, it. Sure. But usually, historically speaking, on this show, if anyone's going to fuck up a, a very well-known phrase, <laughs> it's a Well, weird. you know what? Fair enough. Um, okay. So the test run. Got them a million pounds, which gave the green light to do this full, huge robbery. I am, look, I'm going to say something that's going to make me sound naive. People are going to scream at the recording. I won't know. So I'll sleep at night. Anyway, um, now how big was this bank? Does 26 million feel high? I mean, I don't know how much money a bank keeps on hand at any given moment. I guess because they're printing their own money. Maybe they have a surplus of money. Maybe that's why this bank was targeted specifically. I guess to me, it just feels like a lot to have lying around. Am I crazy? No. Um, but this particular bank was like the headquarters of all of the Northern Bank banks there were ah. like, so many branches of them but this was the headquarters where all the big money's gonna be all right and well, i think they did leave a lot behind that feels like a lot of money anyway well, it's insane to me knowing that uh, there is a bank in my town that if i go there and say hi i'd like to get some american money they look at me and go oh we're gonna have to order that i'm not even kidding i'm yeah. like you don't have on hand well believe it or not now i know this is probably not as hard to believe but you can go to a very large bank in a large city in the u.s of a and ask for canadian money and they also have to order it in so it's wild to me i guess but i would think american money in canada would be more prevalent than canadian money in america that's what i thought 
I you know some Americans I've met elsewhere. were shocked we had our own currency. What did they think we used there? American money. Yeah. Good God. <laughs> heard we're a sovereign nation so but it doesn't matter it's many not the, things it's not the point. about our country it's not the point like the thought the fact they think we all know each other um yeah. the fact that you know something about igloos and it's just constant snow all the time and all of that kind of thing and it's just i've never heard they thought we used their money that was a new one for me it also doesn't help that ours is a rainbow which is beautiful beautiful and then um it just it just looks like monopoly money essentially i had a freak out the other day because i realized soon charles is gonna be on it and i'm upset about it i threw a fit not at the person but in front of the person um at the post office (laughs) thank you for that uh (laughs) When I went to, to get something and I glanced down and all the stamps had fucking Charles on it. And I went, oh, God. And she looked at me and went, I know. And I'm like, I wasn't ready for this and didn't want this. And she went, just wait till they get our money. And I went, oh, no. Like, we had this moment and I'm not ready. I hear yeah. you. I hear you. Oh. All right. Kevin tells security they're doing a massive cleanout, so we'll be making multiple trips to the loading bay. I, again, it just feels like the behavior is so abnormal. I, I'm not judging anyone for believing it. I understand that they would, but it's it is sure. interesting to me that went off without a hitch. Um, yeah, which led had, me had to my ever done that before. Like, it had they feels... ever gone like we're just clearing out? Well, which is why my next note was, are they in on it? This is not me suggesting oh, they are. The I just was like, it, it's it, security. It, are they in on it? Are the, the, at that point I was asking, are Kevin and Chris on in on it? And I know that sounds insane because their families were kidnapped, but here's the thing. We've heard weirder things on this show. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not me automatically trying to whatever. It's just that we've heard it all and nothing. You yeah. have to exhaust everything. And also nothing would surprise me, to be honest. You could tell me. You could tell me that it was, a, you know, whatever. You could tell me any details and I'd go, I believe you. Um, yeah, security still not thinking it's suspicious. The timing of the 999 call that these passersby were like, this is off. Something's off at 813. And then the truck had left at 812. Like, that's wild. Oh, yeah. But yeah. isn't it also interesting that the passersby we're automatically like something feels off about this situation, but the security guards whose job is, I'll say it, securing the building, we're like, this is cool. Yeah. Oh, I have a lot of questions about all those. Also, guards. the specific that it was now a private security firm because they had slashed their budget. It's interesting. It's interesting to think about, right? Um. Okay. Chris's family is still being held hostage by the masked men. Uh, it's 24 hours at this point. I wrote down, what does everyone eat? How does it work when you're being held captive? I'm I'm going to assume that the hostages don't get fed. That's deplorable. Sure. Uh, but this is a genuine question. Have the masked men brought a lunch? Do they bring a sack lunch? Are they are they gonna expect someone in the home to cook for them? Are they ordering in? I'm going to go out on a limb and say they're not ordering in. They don't want the they don't want the yeah. the footprint. And then I'm just like, can you imagine? Like, let's go, let's go take these people hostage. Hold on, let me get my insulated lunch bag. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I mean, this is why we do this because I had not even considered it. Um, so many things at that time, there wouldn't have been like skip the dishes type of situation where you right postmates yeah leave it on a doorstep um so if you're getting delivery is op- the door is opening so yeah they're most likely not doing that but to your point yeah like what if, what if they walk in and they're like what you got because no one's no one's gonna willingly go 24 hours like not the bad they, guys they might they might deny the innocent exactly people, the bad guys yeah they're not gonna sit there and be like you know what are we gonna have i can can you just envision them walking into that kitchen and being like oh, it's like someone doesn't care 
about my gluten allergy. Yes. Like what if exactly. They... Or them getting into an argument about like beans on toast again. I mean, do you want to cook in this stranger's kitchen, Raul? I just the idea that they bring their own snacks. Did they pack them? Did they get their mom to pack them? Oh, did they bring snacks for everybody? Yeah. These are the God, questions that I have. I have a lot of questions. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, Kevin's wife, Karen, taken to so many locations. Yeah. Dumped in a forest. And, and I agree with you. Why did she get it so much worse than Chris's family? Is it because she was younger uh, than his parents? Like, because Chris, it was his parents, right? Like that was the, and the his people. brother and, and the brother's girlfriend. Right. The brother's girlfriend, I guess, being young. But I don't know. Is it because Kevin's wife was seemingly probably in her 30s because he was in his 30s? And then I just wrote down, oh, I know what it was. Misogyny. <laughs> I mean, but it feels like they really wanted to torture her. Like, it feels like they really right? wanted to. Yeah. Especially when it's like, you'd think she'd be less trouble because she's one person. Yeah. Whereas dealing with four people, it's like, I want to know step by step how'd that work like did you all literally just sit in the living room did they allow you to go to the bathroom was there a whole thing like what's going on but then why did she get moved and also because she was blindfolded the entire time is it possible they just literally drove her around and then took her back to her own house it, it but then why possible. if you were gonna dump her in the forest why and why not, instead of taking one to the other, take her and Kevin to Chris's house to leave Karen with the family so that everybody's in one spot and you aren't spreading the group thin in two different locations? Yeah. Then you have more people for nap breaks to stay fresher as a bad guy. You know, like there's just so many. It just doesn't make sense to me. That the family all stayed at the house and then the guys left versus Karen, who was taken multiple places and then dumped in a forest. Yeah. And were the family members blindfolded? Great question. Because you also said that those guys were masked, those bad guys. Uh and it could have been bad people. Don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting, I'm not gendering it. I, I was using the colloquial guys. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Because again, are they taking off the masks to eat? Or is it like a Bella Clava? Like, is the little mouth cut out? My hope is they had to cut the mouth out for themselves. Yep. So it's like really jagged and weird. Yep. But, yeah. um, I also I worry about they... face sweat. I'd be breaking out by the end of that. Oh, I couldn't handle it. Inside no. a house? With a full balaclava on? No thing. Why are we even assuming they're ski masks? They could have been ex-president masks. Oh my God, you're right. We they don't know. They could have been the fucking Tiny Toons for all we know. Yep. I love that of everything I chose. Tiny Toons, yeah. I went Tiny Toons. I don't yeah. know why. Yes, this woman got hypothermia. Treated for hypothermia. Like, this is no joke. Yeah. No joke. Um. Then I wrote... So doing a ghost pottery wheel with me is Christie's dream? Okay. <laughs> I'm a, I'm for it. I just like the very simple. Okay. Okay. I was just simple. like, that's your dream, huh? Done. All right. No problem. Um, It's the fact that the entire robbery was caught on CCTV, but it was not really helpful. And that there's no cameras in the loading bay, which is the only place that the bad guys would have been entering, right? Because they were going in to get the the crates there, right? So there is the possibility that they entered that space. They had to have known there was no cameras there. The fact that they never Mm -hmm. entered the bank, there's no forensics in there. The security budget had been slashed. I don't know. Like, this whole thing is fascinating to me. And I understand it could be just as simple as, you know, whatever, chaos, et cetera. But sure. I don't know. What don't if know. it was old security guards 
and they were these, This starts to feel like we've got a proper motive because again, not only do we have a proper motive, but we have a better context for how they're actually able to pull this off with this much detail, right? Because it would take an outsider so long to understand the intricacies of how the bank even works, right? Yeah. I wouldn't begin to know the ins and outs of like what a day in the bank is like. Right. And they also knew the names of all the family members. And this is pre-social media. Right. Now it's fairly easy to find in most cases. But at that point, that's like boots on the ground kind of work. Thank you for boots on the ground. <laughs> I think we're a boots on the ground podcast. Yeah. Um. Yeah. This whole ruse about how it's like, guess what? We're discontinuing all the old banknotes. I got to tell you, I got to say it. I love it. I love it. Screwing those people out of that much money was, yeah, just well played. Um, So well played. <laughs> Liam Neeson, friend of the podcast. I think we're just going to own that now. Um, Then you brought up the Anglo-Irish War. And that reminded me of a time in my youth when I did a presentation in history class on uh, the IRA, all of these things. And part of my presentation was me singing Zombie by the Cranberries. <laughs> First of all, I can't believe I didn't do that. Um, second of all, classic Lauren. Classic me. Look at you. Any excuse to bring a song. Listen, I mean, that I'll song is, honestly. it's, it's, I mean, deeply connected, obviously. Um, what a joke. <laughs> then I wrote down, Bloody Sunday. Sunday, Bloody Sunday. You too. Bono. <gasps> my first hate mail. Did I ever tell you that the first piece of hate mail I ever received in my entire career was when I was in my very early 20s and I got hired to do one of these like video on trial type shows. It was a different right. version, but it was something like that. For the listeners who don't know, it's basically like a group of comedians watch music videos and make fun of them, poke fun at different things. And it's mostly all in good fun. But I was doing one where I was talking about Bono and it wasn't super, it was funny, but it wasn't like as funny as, as video on trial or the way I remember it. Anyway, so we were kind of talking about scandals and stuff like that also. And I got, I believe it was an email, obviously, that was like from someone who was deeply offended that I had made fun of Bono. Now, the only thing that I made fun of Bono about was his sunglasses he was wearing at the time. And I don't remember exactly what the joke was, but it was, I'll say it, pretty, pretty innocent. Harmless. Harmless joke. And this person was like, you don't know him like I do. His commitment to charity, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, first piece of hate mail. There you go. Huh. But you were on to something if you said anything negative, because little did we know iPhone users were going to be forced, fed their album, whether we liked it or not. And this so. was definitely before that. So, yeah, I think that it had it happened after that, this person would have probably been like, uh, I get it. Sure. I love I like, him, but I like that. Your thing was the sunglasses, and they're like, you're a horrible person. How dare you? Yep. 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 Can't please them all. Can't. Bobby Sands. I just like the name Bobby Sands. Started a hunger strike for 66 days. Here's the thing. I am, there are things on this planet that I am deeply passionate about, that I would go to the ends of the earth for. I, I don't know that I cannot eat for 66 days. Oh. I don't know that I could eat, not eat for 66 hours if I'm being honest. I'm lucky to make it six. I, <laughs> to be honest, it's just a, it's not a life I want to live. I think is the point. Oh, why deny yourself? Not interested in that. No. Um, oh my God, so many things. This was impossibly informative. I got to tell you, I was like taking notes faster than I could write. Um, well, had I known you did a report on some of it, Years ago, I would have held back. No, oh, don't ever. It was a very long time ago. Um, okay, the fact that the same day that they did the raids, there was 50,000 pounds found in this bathroom in this club that was frequented by the police. Was it a prank? Two of the thieves were dressed as cops. That chilled me to my core. Right? Because as you know, there's nothing I fear more on this planet 
dirty than crooked cops. cops. Yeah. Um, we're not saying that's the case. It's just, again, it's another speculation, another thing to think about. Um, you mentioned, I want to say it was Ted Cunningham who pled guilty and didn't go to prison due to poor health. And to that, I say, ah, something other than the American system where they'll lock you up no matter if you're on death's door or not. Yeah, I do find it interesting. I mean, he did some prison time before he was like, oh, wait, this is wrong. And then they he appealed. They let him do that. And they were like, you're right. We need a second trial. No, you should go back to jail. Oh, but you're unwell. You don't have to go. It's interesting. It's it's I mean. I get it. And that's compassion. But also, how did he prove he was unwell? Well, did he just like... I hope he had a doctor's note. Cough at the warden over the phone. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, I have a lot of questions, but I am shocked in a world that's like, oh, yeah. In a world. Thank you very much. um, That he's too unwell. Yeah. To go to jail. That is wild. I just, yeah, I just don't know that there's, I mean, you've got to be pretty sick in the United States of America to avoid jail time. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know that that happens that often. You said enemy of the state. I wrote down enema of the state. Shout out Blink-182. I thought you were going to reference the uh, Will Smith movie. I don't care to. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. <laughs> oh God, this is what I'm learning. The vodka Gatorade goes down too cool, you know. Okay. I get a lot. Um. Then you said DNA on a hat, and I said hat jizz. I'm sorry. I I just I promised I would read them all, and I apologize. <laughs> I assumed sweat, but that's my bad. Sure. No, that's not your bad. It's not your bad. You're just not as out of control as i am okay here's a question don bullman yeah. chef age 30 thank you i was gonna say sounds hot lauren ash stop it you mentioned houston are we talking texas or is there a we houston ireland it was a like it's h-e-u-s-t-o-n oh, interesting okay i may find out that it was mispronounced which is more than likely but You're okay uh, it was the name of the train station, if nothing else. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I was like, did they get caught in America? That doesn't sound right. Then you said proceeds instead of proceeds. I, I tried to. <laughs> I, tra- <laughs> I should have known better. I tried to just. I, I should have let it go. In the, in the moment, I was like, that was a choice. <laughs> you just. Oh. I shouldn't have brought it up. I think what it was, you know what it is? Is I was like, better for me to do it than a stranger. You know? <laughs> oh, I'm I'm sure there's gonna be well that word and laugh emojis uh at some point. But um yeah, I I heard it and just had the slightest moment of what? And then I was like, nope, just hammer it home, keep going. And then I had forgotten about it until this glorious. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Again. No, no, no it, I'd rather hear it from you. Well, then there's only one more comment that is along those lines. But you said Charlie Flanagan. If you think <laughs> every single time I said Irish that my brain wasn't like hard hitting that. I just also don't know that there's a more Irish name than Charlie Flanagan. Like oh Charlie Flanagan is pretty difficult not to say with a little bit of a with oh, a little I am, to it. I am so so incredibly taken with the Irish. Oh yeah. Uh, it's one of my favorite accents. Of I course rec- because of it, I've recently watched PS I Love You. Oh which um is okay. Do I? Oh wow. It's not bad. Um, I liked, um, oh my God, Jeffrey Dean Morgan. There we go. Jeffrey Dean Morgan in that is great. (laughs) Um, Harry Connick Jr. is so incredibly awkward that I also love him in that, but it was okay. But then I wasn't done, um, with Ireland. So I watched, God, what is it called? Wild Mountain Time or something which has 
uh, who's the Fifty Shades guy? Jamie Dornan. There it is. That guy. Um, I love that Fifty Shades was the only thing I could think he was in, and I've never seen it. Um, him and Emily Blunt and, oh, fuck. <laughs> this is another pussy throat cancer, but <laughs> Madman. Um, January Mad Jones. Madman, uh, hog of a cock. <laughs> Is it John Hamm? <laughs> the anyone who misses the end bit might be starting to miss the best part. Um, oh, it's a cock. This is on par with hat jizz. <laughs> We're meeting each other at a level. Um, it's just <laughs> we've all seen the we've all seen the photos. Yeah, yeah, we've yeah. all seen them. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us more than others. Some of us have revisited, clearly. <laughs> I've seen a few times. Sure. Um, it, it was shocking. Sure. It was yeah. shocking. Um, I don't, like, I love, I'm sitting here and I'm like, can we really say that on the show? Hog of a cock? Yeah, I think we can. <laughs> I hope so, because we've said it. There's an explicit times. warning and we are who we are. You're right right yep i mean <laughs> what the fuck this is i mean again what pussy throat I, what i love is that my text tone for you is still pussy throat cancer every time <laughs> and now it's gonna be proceeds i don't even i how did i say it hog of a cock might win out i'm gonna be honest not charlie flanagan charlie flanagan <laughs> i did hit feel i hit that a little harder than i needed to it was I'm a lucky. very uh lucky I made it through. david harbour it was just oh, a mile. harbour of course yeah. of course final thought <laughs> <laughs> bringing it back to the case a final thought final note i wrote would we say patty hurst was a tiger kidnapping oh because she was kind of forced into doing a crime right and then she eventually right i think so like her version is definitely her version would be that she it was a, it was a tiger kidnapping. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great call. I love that my main interest in tiger kidnappings was when's it been done in a movie? Oh yeah, Johnny Depp in 1995. Yeah. Well, listen. Chrissy Oxborough, what a I'll say it. GD romp. This has been glorious. Mm. it was impossibly informative entertaining and uh also it taught us about a case i'd never heard of before what a gift to all of us hey and sometime just like ask me an actor's name and we'll prove that i've forgotten and i'll tell you who they are through physical attributes I'm and for right those now. who don't know what we're talking about just google it <laughs> <laughs> i googled john ham I think sweatpants or something, isn't it? Fuck, I don't remember. I think Point if you is... put hog of a cock, it might come up also. Hogs before <laughs> frogs. Any hoodle. What a gift in my life. I want to remind you, we started this with me showing this picture that I drew of an alien. Then I said, look at his crotch, because I thought it was cute. Doesn't matter. The point yeah. is, dear listeners, we thank you so much for coming with us on this <laughs> wild journey. Um, if you haven't already, <laughs> give us a follow on the socials on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at True Crime Cocktails, on Twitter at Nuts Detectives. If you're looking for more of this kind of content, as well as uh, more true crime, more uh, live Q&As, all kinds of things, go over to patreon.com slash true crime and cocktails, where you can learn more about our subscription-based service over there. And of course, the only place for official True Crime and Cocktails merch is, of course, truecrewmerch.com. Uh, the Halloween ghosties merch is back. So check that out while it's still available. It'll be there till the end of the month. Um, once again, well, Christy, do you want to remind the people about next week's episode? I mean, you can, you, you don't get to do it very often. On the next true crime and cocktails. Last stop, Larima. 
Just a reminder, that documentary comes out on Max on October 8th. That's Sunday. Our episode comes out on October 10th. So make sure you catch it Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday before you listen to the episode because we're going to get into all of it. Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night, Lauren's alien drawing. <laughs> and his crutch. Good night, hog of a cock. <laughs>